People will continue to drift in because we do have a hard stop at 1230 and I want to make sure we have plenty of time to present and have conversation. If I didn't just say it, I am Angela Glover Blackwell. I'm the founder and CEO of PolicyLink and PolicyLink is very excited to uh, be a part of this and I am honored to facilitate this conversation which is about communities of opportunity. I want to take just a few minutes before I introduce the panel and get, we get into discussion to talk about communities of opportunity and I'm going to talk about it from a personal perspective. Um, I grew up in a segregated St. Louis, Missouri in the 1950s and the early 1960s. And I had the blessing in life to actually grow up in a community of opportunity. Sometimes when I say that, first segregated and then opportunity, people are a little surprised. And it is uh, always a pleasure for me to be able to help people to understand that even during uh, the days of segregation, and my segregated experience was both under legal segregation and segregation that continued after the laws had been changed, very little changed in my day-to-day uh, -day living. In this community where I grew up, I went to all black schools, the church was black, the neighborhood was black, the places where we volunteered, all the people were black. The only time I came in contact with white people in my growing up was when we went downtown to shop. That was pretty much the extent of it. And it was the most magnificent growing up you can possibly imagine. It really has been the blessing in my life. Um, the schools were extraordinary. They were all black, but my teachers were exceptional because it was at a time in St. Louis where there were a lot of black people who had access to higher education and the only opportunities open to them were teaching. So that my high school English teacher had a PhD from Columbia University and he was one of the most literate people I have ever met to this day. My Spanish teacher took a trip to a Spanish speaking country, Spain, Mexico, every summer and brought back things for us after that. My journalism teacher was the editor of the uh, African American newspaper. So my high school experience was absolutely extraordinary. And even though I grew up in a segregated St. Louis, Missouri, I tell people that the 4900 block of Terry is the most integrated place I ever lived. And I have lived all over the world, not to mention in lots of places around the United States. And what made it the most integrated place I've ever lived is that it was economically integrated. Because since we were living in a segregated time, all the black people lived in my large black community. So the few doctors that were in the community lived there, the lawyer lived there, the um, people who were uh, faith leaders lived there, small businesses, but also the families that were receiving what we used to call then aid to families with dependent children lived there, the postal workers lived there, the janitors lived there. It was an economically integrated community. It also had the luxury of really outstanding amenities because the neighborhood that we lived in, my family actually, you know, I talk about it as a black uh, experience. It actually didn't start off that way. My black family was the second to move on to our block, the second black family to move on to our block, the first having moved in the day before. And, but within two years, all the white people had moved out. I used to think when I was a girl that we were a powerful family, that we were able to, to do that. But there were lots of amenities there. They weren't there for us. They had been there for the people who were there before. So we had grocery stores and drug stores and a wonderful park. There was a wonderful uh, trolley system that could take you any place that you needed to get to. Streetcars, I think we called them then. I haven't seen one in so long. I mean, we call them streetcars. Um, we actually had one of the best swimming pools in the entire city as part of a city-run recreation center. Um, the neighborhoods were clean, the streets were safe, the amenities were there. Everything that we needed existed. And I didn't know the phrase communities of opportunity then. I didn't think of that at all. But I realized looking back that the high quality education I received in those schools and I went on to college at Howard University, that the opportunity my brothers and I had to be able to access anything in the St. Louis community, both because of a high quality public transportation system, but also because of caring adults who made sure that they exposed the children to everything there was, the best that St. Louis had to have. The best that St. Louis could offer was available to us.
I realize that the health that I'm able to bring to my life now, not having suffered from childhood obesity as a child because we walk to school, I walk to school every day, my elementary school was on the corner, my high school was a mile away, the fresh fruits and vegetables that were readily available because we had several grocery stores in the area. So when I think back, my health because of economic activity and safety, my education because of a high quality public high school system, access to opportunity because of an infrastructure that really worked, and parents, both of whom were teachers, because they were good government jobs that allowed black people to become part of the middle class. I had the blessing of being a child who grew up in a community of opportunity. Now we have to figure out how to go back and create that. It happened for things that were good, I just talked about them, and things that were bad, segregation that forced us all into that community. Now we have to think about through public policy and other strategies, we can create communities of opportunity for all. And we have a great panel to help us get into that discussion. Uh, we have on the panel, um, people who bring a variety of points of view and variety of experiences to this very important conversation. We have right here uh, Dr. Zab Briggs, Associate Professor of Sociology and Urban Planning at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Next to him, we have uh, Reverend Luis Cortez, President of Esperanza Community Development Corporation. Next is Dr. Scott Cowan, President of Tulane University. And next is Sarah Bird Sharps, Co-Director of the American Human Development Project. The way I thought we'd do this conversation is to start with Sarah, because she's heard me tell my story, and I'd love to hear her, have her now talk about the kind of indicators that she's been working on to really identify when you, what the issues are, what the indicators are of opportunity. And then I thought I would ask each of the panels to take about five minutes and talk about what are the three most important things we could do to create communities of opportunity for all? If we have time, I'll ask a follow-up question. If we don't, I'll turn to the audience. I'd love to spend at least 20 minutes with you chatting, and then we'll stop right at 12.30 as we've been instructed. Sarah? Great. Thanks so much. So one of the projects of this uh, summit, leading up to the summit, was to try to look at constructing an index. And uh, as uh, Angela mentioned, I work for this, the Social Science Research Council. We were commissioned to put together this opportunity index, and it's going to be presented today. And I hope you'll all go to the website uh, and have a look at where your county and where your state ranks. So just to say, how do we come about uh, you know, with the indicators that we're measuring in this index? So this morning we heard a lot about lots of things that, uh, that shape the opportunities that are open to people. So a set of things which you actually can't change, which is you know, whether you were born to parents who had a college education or not, whether you were born to a teen mom, what your racial ethnic heritage is. Okay, so that's one set of things. A second set of factors that really shape your opportunity are your own personal attributes and behaviors, whether you have pluck and determination and ambition and charisma or not. And, and that, that is another set that, that ample evidence shows really matters for opportunity. We looked at a third set. The third set of factors are the opportunities present in communities. We chose to focus on this third set because some communities have characteristics that really open lots of windows of opportunity and others offer few footholds for that climb up the ladder. Um, the other reason that we thought that it was really important to measure this third set of factors is because these areas of opportunity are amenable to change. And so it's really our hope that this index will be a tool for policymakers, for engaged citizens, and for you all to figure out to understand the interconnected factors in our own communities that shape opportunity and to be able to take action to remove the barriers to these to the opportunity in, in your community. So the index includes three basic areas. The first one is jobs and local economy. The second one is education. And the third one is community, health, and civic life. And there's a set of small set of indicators within each of these. Um, and the result for, for the index was a ranking of all 50 states from, and now I'm going to spill the beans, Connecticut to Nevada at the bottom, and a grading of 2,400 2, counties from A to F. 
And that the way that the, the index is constructed is that it looks how counties and states fare as, composed, as compared with all other counties and states on each of the indicators. And I would encourage you to explore this on your own. The uh, website is called opportunityindex.org. It went live uh, last night. And you can look at you know, your zip code, you can look at your county, you can look at your state, and you can see how your community fares compared with others on a broad set of indicators and it tells you um, not only where you rank, but you know, how your community is doing in terms of internet access, preschool um, access, jobs and wages, uh, health, healthy foods in your neighborhood, et cetera. Now, I, so that's for you guys all to do. And then I'm going to just take like one or two minutes to talk about some of the most interesting findings that we found uh, very quickly. So one thing that was very interesting was that the 15 highest scoring states are pretty evenly distributed across the nation. So there's five in the Northeast, five in the Midwest, three in the South Atlantic, and two in the West. And what they share in common, interestingly, is not that they excel in one area, such as jobs and salaries, but that they have a pretty balanced performance across all three dimensions. That was what really propelled them to the top. Now, the lo of the lowest 15 states, 12 are in the south, and the remaining three are Arizona, New Mexico, and Nevada. Nevada was at the very bottom. And interestingly, Nevada, while strong on earnings and jobs, it really lags behind in other critical areas of opportunity, and that's what uh, brought it down to the bottom. Now, a second thing, finding that I thought was really interesting, is when we talk about opportunity, people tend to focus very heavily on jobs and wages. But while both are, of course, in included in the index, they're critical for opportunity, and they certainly matter a lot, neither have the strongest relationship with the overall index. And in fact, the indicators that had the strongest relationship with the overall index were teens not in school and not working, which many people call disconnected youth. The second one was the poverty rate. And the third one was per percentage of adults with a bachelor's degree. Um, and then just a couple of other things. So we, a couple of other things that we looked at um, with external indicators to see what the relationship is. So we did some analysis on rankings on the opportunity index and other important indicators. And we found that states with less opportunity tend to have a very high, a much higher burden of other undesirable outcomes, such as uh, high teen pregnancy rates, high incarceration rates, high, high child poverty rates. And that relationship was strong across all the states. And there was also a very strong relationship between disconnected youth, kids 16 to 19 who aren't in school and aren't working, and violent crime rates. Now, in terms of counties, and I'm, I'm just going to say two other findings that were really interesting and then wrap up. So one of them was the internet. So counties that got an A had far, far higher rates of internet in the home. Inter internet connectivity in the home. And what was really interesting was it kind of went down by a gradient. So it's not like just if you got an A, you had high internet and all the rest were sort of medium or low. It kind of went down the Bs and the Cs and the Ds and the Fs, at, you know, a gradient along the way, which was really fascinating. The other thing that really struck us, I think, in collecting these indicators and analyzing them is that there's a huge range across this one nation in terms of uh, opportunity uh, in, these, in these areas. So for instance, the violent crime rate in Buffalo City, Wisconsin is 10 per 1,000 residents. In St. Louis, Louis, Missouri, it's over 2,200 per 100,000 residents. So the spread is really enormous among them. Thank you. Um, now we're going to hear about what we need to do about it. Before I turn to the panel, and I just want to point out that one of the things that we've been focused on a lot at PolicyLink is the changing demographics and what that has to do with the challenges we face as a nation. We've been all hearing that by 2050 we'll be a nation in which the majority of people are people of color. Since the census, we now know that that'll happen by 2042. Right now, 46.5% of all children under 18 are children of color, and by the end of this decade, the majority will be by 2019. By 2030, the majority of young workers to under 25 
survive will be people of color. And so as we think about the future, it's important to think about these challenges within the context of who really are the people who are going to be the future and how do we make sure that they're prepared to do all of the lofty, wonderful, and appropriate things we talked about upstairs. And so I think that that will come out as we continue this conversation. Why don't we start with you, uh, Reverend Cortez, and hear about what you think we ought to be doing. Well, um, Esperanza is a network. It's a faith-based network of about 13,000 churches and about 500 uh, 501c3 nonprofits. They're all Latino, and we're like Baskin Robbins. 31 varieties of the same thing because we're all religious, but we rarely agree on anything except that uh, there's poverty in our community. Um, if, if Because I have uh, five minutes and I'm going to try to keep to it, and I'm already behind. Uh, I, wa I want to say the three things up front and then say a little bit about them. One, um, it's important that we listen and resource local models of success. Um, as a person that works in Philadelphia, where we're based, we are constantly uh, uh, um, approached by folks who have an idea, a theory, and then they want us to use our community as guinea pigs. I'm being a little harsh. But that's how we feel, and we've been doing this work since 1981. And so it's strange, we've been very successful, and we have colleagues around the nation who've been successful in different settings with different uh, Hispanic minority groups. And no one ever asked them why are they being successful. Instead, we will get an institution, or there's no foundation here, so that'll be easier. Or a foundation, I'll pick on them now. But you might be in the crowd, so please don't be one of those foundations. But we'll have someone come tell us, this is a theory or this is an idea, and we would love for you to do this based on your track record of success. And our response to that always is, uh-uh. Based on our track record of success, shouldn't you be joining with us and helping us? So that's one item. Second item, do not exclude organizations of faith especially in poverty communities. They're one of the few institutions that are local grassroots institutions where even God submits to the culture and the language of the neighborhood. So do not exclude organizations of faith. The other one is to empower quality leadership. And, and that's a, a difficult one because there's different barometers for how you would uh, make that assessment. But it's usually, that assessment is usually not made in inner city communities. So the focus should be on grassroots systems and what we're hoping for as we move forward to create an opportunity nation is that researchers will work for successful local programs, not vice versa. I think that's really important. As an intermediary, uh, Esperanza has funded, we've done uh, about $10 million of funding to faith-based and, uh, faith and community-based Latino nonprofits in, in about a, a decade. So we've done about re-granting, it's called re-granting, a foundation will give us a grant, we re-grant it or we get a government um, contract, the government likes to call them grants, but they're actually contracts. We'll get a government contract and then we'll, we'll resource our, our groups. And as an intermediary, we have found that most of the groups we're working with, because they are faith-based, do not attract support, but they are, in fact, the most, one of the most grassroots organizations you could work with. I mean, in every Latino community, you'll have the most grassroots would be the beauty parlor, followed by the grocery store, followed by the community bar, and then you have the church. Those are four institutions that are owned and operated by Latino people right in the neighborhood. So we own them. The other institutions, uh, if they're not charter schools or private Latino schools, there are very few private Latino schools in inner cities, by the way. But the only other institution I would put up there would be a charter school that's community run, uh, local community run. So, um, so for me, I, I think the issue of, um, and since I got, I got two more minutes. So um, the other one I want to talk about is there's this historical logic that we have to find ways to connect folks in our communities to the jobs that are out there. The reality is we can do that for a small percentage of people who live in, I'm going to use the, the euphemism, inner city where we live. And so the, the logic is that capital will move families and families will move to capital. That is a true logic for 
take a number. I don't, I'm not a, I don't have the numbers with me, but maybe 6% of our community. So what happens to the other 94%? So uh, I'm belie I believe that um, the way to, uh, to address that is to begin to use more charter schools and create public education. And I'll, I'll end with this. We have a charter school, and our ratio used to be five to one. In other words, we had, to, uh, we had 100 employees. Five would come from outside the community for every one because they had to, have, they had to qualify to teach. We are now at a ratio that is 3.8 to 1. Our goal is to create our own teachers who will be one to one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's turn now to uh, Dr. Scott Cowan at Tulane University. We met while Policy Link was working in New Orleans, and we talked a lot at that time about schools and communities of opportunity, and I'm dying to hear how things have been going since. Thank you. First of all, you should know that I was born and raised in New Jersey, but my heart and soul is in New Orleans. And I can remember the very specific day that New Orleans got transformed from a community in stagnation to a community of opportunity. That day was October 29, 2005. For those of you who are not familiar with that date, that's the date that Katrina made landfall in New Orleans and basically destroyed our city, my university, my life, and the life of thousands of people in New Orleans. It was also a time where the federal government, the state government, and the local government were not there for us. Shortly after that storm, many of the people who led organizations in New Orleans got together. And we had to do some soul searching about the future of our city. And we certainly knew we had to survive. We certainly knew we had to recover. But the question was, could we use this moment to reimagine what New Orleans could become? And we took a blood oath amongst all of us that it wasn't enough just to survive and to recover. This was a time to reimagine New Orleans. Not because it was an opportunity to do that, it was because it was our responsibility to do it. To those that came through Katrina and those that would follow them thereafter. And we laid out a pathway for opportunity, and I want to share three of those points with you today because I believe very strongly that was our pathway to opportunity. And I think many of the things we learned you will also find will resonate with you, even though none of them are new or novel. Prior to Katrina, we had one of the worst public school systems in America. Matter of fact, of the 100 largest urban school systems in America, we were 97th. So we decided our first task, if we really were going to build a community of opportunity, was to reinvent public education. The entire system was closed down after Katrina, and we brought together a community-wide group that was tasked to develop a new vision and strategy for public education. We did that. We're now in the fifth year of that transformation. If President Obama were here today or Secretary Duncan were here, I think both of them would say it's the largest transformation of a public school system in America. And what we essentially did was to decentralize accountability and decision making down to the school level and to eliminate the bureaucracy that was overwhelming our public school system. We happened to do that through the vehicle of charter schools and today 80 percent of the students in New Orleans are in charter schools and within three years that will be 90 percent. It wasn't just the vehicle of charter schools that led for the transformation, it was also a tremendous investment in human capital to make those charter schools work. So human capital and getting superior talent said we should decentralize and let the good people make their decisions. We can't declare victory yet when it comes to public education, but so far it's very encouraging. Prior to Katrina, when we took a poll of how many people in New Orleans were optimistic about the future of public education in New Orleans, the results usually came in 15 to 20 percent. Our latest poll said that 80 percent of the populace of New Orleans was optimistic about the future of public education. Prior to Katrina, 68 percent of the public schools in New Orleans were considered failed schools 
Today it's down to 17 percent. And we anticipate in the next three to four years that we should be able to get that down to a very small single-digit number. Our belief, fundamental belief, that if we don't get public education right in our community, there's nothing else that will help because a poor public education system will ultimately lead to people who are unemployed, without credentials, and there's a positive correlation between that, unemployment, and crime, bad health outcomes, and blighted neighborhoods. The second thing we decided to do, and it plays on something Sarah mentioned was, while we're fixing public education, we come, came to realize that there are millions of disconnected youth in America, where the school system has already failed them. And now we're focusing on disconnected youth in our community, defined as 16 to 24 years old, to get them connected to jobs and to credentials that will allow them to have jobs. All I will tell you, as I've done uh, dozens of listening tours in New Orleans with disconnected youth, and if you really want to learn about how there's an opportunity with disconnected youth, go talk to them. Many societies see them as liabilities. I could tell you they are tremendous assets, just dying to have that opportunity. The third and last thing I would mention is, is that I learned an important lesson also about the role of universities. Many, in, in many of our communities, our universities are anchor institutions, which means they're the largest employers and the largest economic engines. In New Orleans, we're the largest private employer and the third largest in the state. And even though we are a national and internationally known university, it began to get me to think that we have to redefine a part of our mission and to elevate the notion of community engagement and opportunity creation to be as important as research and teaching. And we have, the reason I'm here today and I go to any, all of these opportunities is, is to push the message among my colleagues, not just the community colleges I all already think do a superb job, but I'm talking about the four-year colleges and I'm talking about the most elite of the four-year colleges. To remember as an anchor institution, we are a vehicle for opportunity for others by using our size and our heft and the human capital we have. So those are the three takeaways that I have for what I have seen work in New Orleans. And as I said, it is a, a glorious day every day to wake up in New Orleans and hear people say how hopeful they are about the future when before Katrina, there was nothing but a city in decline. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your leadership there. I want to turn now to uh, Dr. Zav Briggs. He's a good friend. It's hard for me to put that doctor in front of it. it, it all right. <laughs> uh, but I, we want to hear from you, uh, your five minutes, and I also hope that you will touch on the particular challenges if you don't live in a community where you have everything, how mm -hmm. you access it. Okay. Yep. Wonderful. Thanks, Angela. Um, hello, everybody. It's great to be here. First, I want to say amen to the things I've heard so far. I want to add a 20-second uh, extension to, to what Sarah had to say. She called off three categories. Do you remember them? Stuff you can't control, like your birth circumstances and your genes and how educated your parents were and whatnot. Second was a set of sort of individual traits that do help determine success. Um, in my business, in academia, they're sometimes called psychosocial because it's like stuff in your head and stuff that's social between you and other people. And um, third was the stuff that's in the, in the Opportunity Index. I want to note for the record, as we talk about some mechanisms and recreating communities of opportunity, especially where they've disappeared the worst uh, over the last generation, that that third set of things and these mechanisms we're talking about are also enormously important for shifting that middle category of individual traits and, of course, over time, changing birth circumstances which have the biggest long-run effects, right, on the next generation. Uh, an opportunity nation, I would argue, is a nation that grows talent and imagination and self-confidence that happens in particular kinds of communities and through particular kinds of experiences and schools uh, like the ones that Scott and Luis and, and Angela all talked about. So we can move that middle stuff, too, and we desperately need to. Um, let me move on. Angela brought up demography. And she alluded to what is sometimes shorthanded as the 
the graying and browning of America, the aging of the population, and the growing racial and ethnic diversity, as shorthand, the graying and the browning of America, sometimes referred to that way. <laughs> no comment on that. <laughs> Angela does not age. I've known her a long time. Um, there's a third trend, and it's the one that in some ways separates us even more from the other wealthy nations, the kinds of places that Arianna Huffington and others were referring to earlier. And that is our growth rate. It's something very basic if you're a, a demographer. We are far and away the fastest growing of all the wealthy nations. Here I have to respectfully disagree with Rick Warren on the subject of immigration. It is not only over the medium to long haul an enormous resource for this country, as it long has been, and extremely important for our economy. Uh, almost every market you look at in our country, and almost every product category, and almost every kind of service, all the major growth prospects have to do with uh, immigration and, and people of color. We're going through tough times now. There's competition, competition for jobs, no question. Um, but I would have framed his point quite differently if I were talking about immigration and its role in our future. Why do I mention growth? Well, it connects to the three mechanisms I want to talk about. Uh, briefly. One is housing and a more inclusionary approach to housing. Two is job networks. And three is the future of health and wellness in a country that has some of the best uh, health science on earth and some of the most ridiculous health outcomes, right, given how much we spend. Um, why is growth, just in population, an opportunity for us? Well, we are going to grow so fast over the next generation or so that we are going to need about one-third again as much built stuff, buildings including housing, as you see around you right now. Um, the big question is, what will that growth look like? And will it be inclusionary growth? And at the heart of that question, in turn, is will housing be more inclusionary than it has been in the past? So I would argue, Angela, mechanisms-wise, that one of the places you begin is to say uh, the creation of communities of opportunity has sort of two sides to it. It is both about connecting all communities and the communities that already exist uh, to opportunity, and especially those that are most isolated, of course. We've heard a lot about that so far. It is also about expanding access to places um, that are not accessible, especially to the poor and people of modest income um, and very often people of color. It's not always suburbs, by the way, but it is places that are less accessible. And one of the reasons is uh, they don't build a variety of housing. They don't build housing that's meant for people at a range of different income levels. Uh, there are places in America where if you, you get up in a, in a zoning meeting and say the word apartment, people will rampage. Um, there's a lot of nimbyism. You know, I don't want that in my community. That doesn't belong here. And we've got to change that. One of my students, and he grew up on the streets, he grew up in a very violent neighborhood. Um, he spent eight years in the Marines, fought in Iraq. He's at grad school in MIT now. He's an incredible human being. He asked in class yesterday, you know, why is it that middle class people in suburbs are forever running around looking for ways to go into poor neighborhoods and organize people there? Why aren't they... You can see where I'm going with the story. Why aren't they organizing and changing the face of affordable and inclusionary housing? Thank you. Um, and making these job connections in the communities that they come from, persuading people they grew up with, running for office in those communities, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, point number two, and some of this can happen in the next 12 to 24 months. Um, we are at a point in our history where we desperately need, and I just spent the last three years in Barack Obama's budget shop, so I can tell you I've seen the red ink. Uh, we desperately need to bring down the cost of health care while improving outcomes. It is a perfect storm, use whatever metaphor you want. Uh, it is a, an irresistible force. We have to get this done. One of the things that is essential to getting this done is connecting all communities, all neighborhoods, even the most isolated, uh, to a system that is much more prevention-oriented, that does create access to healthy food, safer streets, healthier homes that don't trigger childhood asthma and all these ridiculous conditions that send people, especially the poor, into emergency rooms into acute care, into extremely expensive 
back-end forms of health care, right, when we could be solving the problems up front. That has to be part of a, uh, an opportunity nation and creating communities of opportunities, extending the health system into these neighborhoods, community health clinics, connections to hospitals, and a very heavy emphasis on prevention, which goes beyond medical care as we know it. And the final thing is job networks, uh, and others uh, referred to or alluded to this. You don't recreate a labor market in a neighborhood. You don't recreate an entire banking system in a neighborhood. Community development, for example, has never worked effectively that way. You have to push those systems to have points of connection in every neighborhood. It might be simply information and a point of referral. It might be that transit stop that Angela talked about. It is someone who connects you to systems that are much larger than those isolated neighborhoods. That's absolutely essential, and that can begin right away. Thank you very much. I want to open it up to questions from you. It would be nice. Yes. Um, uh, Sabrina? Sabrina here with the mic. All right. Quickly, we don't have much time. And, and be thinking about questions. The next time I'll take two, but there's a the mic in the middle. I can talk pretty loud. Okay. Um, so my question is um, for Sarah. I have questions for all of you, but I'll just ask one now. So Shoot. <laughs> um, when you're talking about the worst uh, States. Well, one thing I know that we need to have metrics, and I understand that states would be a, a, an easy way to break up uh, communities. But when you say Nevada and Arizona are among the worst, um, I'm from California, and I've lived all across the state of California. And things that come to mind are the number of retirees in Nevada and Arizona, and how did you take that into account? And then, in addition, if you look at like Southern Lake Tahoe, that's part of Nevada, and it's a very affluent place. Um, sorry. You get the question. Okay. All right. <laughs> I guess um, an index is the beginning of the conversation. It's really a way to get people to understand all these factors in one interconnected way. And then it gets people thinking about what's going on in Nevada and what's going on in parts of Nevada. Now, obviously, states in America are range from the, range from the huge to the smaller, but they encompass a, a large population. Within a state, lots is going on, which is why we looked at the county level. And I think even going below the county level, there's a lot one can, can learn beneath that. So it's really a way of, um, you know, we all know kind of objectively, uh, sorry, we all know intuitively kind of the place I live is dead end, I got to get out of here, or the place I live, you know, is filled with universities, choices and whatever, but this is a way to quantify it so that you begin to know what's the objective picture. But of course, once you know that, you got to go beyond that. You got to understand what are the differences, what's, what are the causes of it, you know, the demographics, all, all, of the, all of the reasons behind it. So you can't tailor make policies, you got to really look at what, what are the conditions in your place and what are the policies that would be most effective. Thank you. Um, we have several. Let's take two questions and then hear from the panel and then we'll go to the third. My question is, I'm Mildred Wiley from Chicago, Illinois, and I'm trying to connect my community of poverty to the community of capital. We have great ideas and solutions that we want to. It's also trying to find people to help fund and help learn and teach some people who have concepts. That's my question. Hi, my name is Ian. I'm from Hawaii. Uh, I'm just going to throw a few quick statistics here about Hawaii because we're a very kind of different community, I personally think. So we're very far away from the mainland United States, about 2,000 miles from California. We have a, a central state education system with minimum community input. And we suffer from what we collectively kind of see as a huge brain drain where we have the people who have the um, best ideas, the ones who have the most opportunity, leaving Hawaii as quickly as they possibly can. Um, so I feel like this really compounds things. And to wrap it up real quick, how can we help promote a community of opportunity where we're a very isolated community in which people, if they want opportunity, seem to run the other way? Thank you. Can I have a quick shot at, at both? Uh, to the, the lady who asked about uh, connections and capital and ideas and so on, um, a, a very quick response and a, and a quick cautionary tale as, as a part of that. Years ago when the empowerment zones were launched, uh, one of the ideas that was copycatted from city to city was known as one-stop capital shop. And in Detroit in particular, which could not afford this outcome, the one-stop capital shop ended up being what I call a non-traditional capital shop in that there was very quickly no capital there. 
Um, the mistake that folks made was parking a bunch of banks in the neighborhood on the assumption there would be a lot of bankable ideas, a lot of great startup ideas, um, when in point of fact, folks had to work intensively to coach, to uh, teach people how to develop business plans, to work to hone the ideas to make them more financeable. And that is often a great place to begin. Universities have business assistance and outreach centers, and you can talk to your local banks with that kind of thing in mind. And to the gentleman who asked about out-migration, um, education and investment in anchor institutions has turned out to be one of the most crucial things uh, for responding to that. Thank you. Anybody have any additional comments before we get to the other thing? Uh, I would just uh, talk about the brain drain for mm -hmm. a minute. I mean, I think the key here, obviously, is to... Is to transform the city or the area into community, if not opportunity, at least hope. And the way you do that is just the kinds of things Xavier was saying is, take an area, whatever it may be, and I, I, public education has to be one. Uh, another one can certainly be uh, uh, entrepreneurship and promoting creativity and innovation in support of it. So you begin to change the culture, and the culture begins to change the perception and then it begins to attract different people and it keeps them. Thank you very much. Let's take these three questions and then we'll end up. Hi, my name is Angela Gross. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm a student at Princeton University. And I was wondering what the role of Promise Neighborhoods is in all this. I know Ms. Glover Blackwell, you've done a lot with that. Um, what is the role of Promise Neighborhoods in creating communities of opportunity? Um, and what is the potential for this model to expand and sort of grow? Thank you. Hello, my name's Jonathan Zeichner. I'm here from Los Angeles. And uh, you know, while I do not wish a catastrophe on LA, I'm not the only person who would like to see the school system there burned to the ground and started over from scratch. And I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about clean slate approaches to public school system um, in, in a slow motion catastrophe that's going on. And, and so it's being deconstructed very, very slowly. And it's got it's to accelerate. Hello, my name is Rolanda Shan. Um, I'm from Miami-Dade College. One of my questions is, um, in my community, we face a lot of undocumented students. Um, how do you promote communities of opportunity for these students? What would you suggest that we do? Dr. Cohen, you just said, if not opportunity, at least hope. How do you give hope to an uh, 11 or 12-year-old child who feels like there is no hope because we're undocumented and we have no education. We can't uh, obtain a higher education. Thank you. I'll let you all answer the questions. I'll say something about Promise Neighborhoods in my wrap-up. I also want you all to know that you have the ability to use Twitter to ask any question that you would like, and we'll have a way of getting back to every single question. Yes. Well, um, to, uh, I will, the lady from Chicago, I'll be glad to talk to you about economic development. It's you can't just have a you can't have a, a thirty second response. So I can talk to you after. But but I, I want to say on the undocumented students and also on the clean slate. Every university can take students, and what a university does with its own scholarship money is the university's business. Having said that, it would take a group of citizens to have that conversation with the appropriate administration at a school. You cannot have. Um, you can't have the undocumented students going in to see the president or the heads of schools. So, so it's a it's a one-to-one -one institution by institution conversation, where you're not going to get 50 scholarships. But I, we have worked with the university, and we we know that it can be done, and it is being done throughout the country. So, so I want to say that as one response. Uh, the other one is on the school movement. Um, there is a there is a national movement. If you haven't heard about it, stay tuned because it's going to start. Actually, it gets kicked off sometime in the spring on charter schools and on on the war for charter schools. Um, there's a lot of resistance to charter schools because of the you know the traditional I'll call it the traditional public school system um, has a lot of uh, fiscal. Uh, influence in in politics, and so there's always going to be that kind of of knockdown drag out, if I can call it that. But uh, but you can start one school at a time in your neighborhood, and and then the other piece that isn't happening 
is charter schools need to start talking to themselves so they can organize to fight back. Dr. Cowan, you want to say something about the L.A. question? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I do. Uh, you know, the question I get asked most often is, is how do you get to change absent a bona fide crisis? I mean, we had a bona fide crisis in New Orleans, and, and um, we found the silver lining of it. Uh, there, there's no simple answer other than you manufacture the crisis or you have incredibly courageous political leaders who are willing to take this on and be in office one term. Um, and uh, quite honestly, I think we need a lot more of them uh, who are willing to, because on the school transformation, you can do it at the margin, and all of our cities are doing it at the margin. And, and it does help at the margin to do something rather than nothing. But if you want wholesale, it's going to take a will on part of the private citizens and the local government to say this has to be done because if we don't get it right, we don't have a future. It is not surprising that we're not moving the dial on this issue from a country point of view. We may community by community, but not as a country. And until we figure that one out, it's going to be tough to really create this opportunity nation the way we envision Scott, it. you said something that I want to underscore, and I don't want to misstate it, but I, when you presented, you talked about how the crisis was utilized as a way to bring accountability to every building. Right. Absolutely. And that you did that through charters. You didn't say the purpose was to create charters and that that happened to bring accountability. So I wanted to give you a chance to come back to that so that people aren't left thinking there's only one route. Well, I was, it's interesting because I was going to come back to the question that uh, uh, the Reverend said, and that is charters are not an end to themselves. They're a means to an end. People focus too much on the charter. You know, a, a charter simply won't improve the school system. What you have to do is have an entire system of human capital investment, and then you have to have uh, an infrastructure of development of that human capital over time, facilities and everything lined up. And then what you find is, much like we do in universities and businesses, if you have the right people, you want to decentralize decision making and hold them accountable for results. And the only thing that matters is student achievement. That's all that matters. Is there one more burning question? Uh, all right, you'll, you'll get it through Twitter. I want to give the panel a chance if there's anything more you want to say. If not, I'm going to summarize. Yes, Sam. No, no, please. So there was a promised neighborhood question. Um, Jeff Canada uh, really inspired not only a lot of people all over the country, but he uh, inspired Senator Obama when he was running for president. He said if he got elected, he was going to create 20 promised neighborhoods across the country. It is happening. There have, there's been one round with 21 sites getting planning grants, and now there's another round that's about to come out probably by the end of the year with anywhere from four to six moving into implementation and then some more planning grants. Uh, PolicyLink, the organization I lead, has the honor of running the Promise Neighborhoods Institute, which is a foundation supported support system for the Promise Neighborhoods. You can find it on our website, policylink.org, and I would urge you to go and find that. I just wanted to say by way of summary, this was, oh, I'm sorry. There yes. was one thing I did want to say. We haven't discussed, and I haven't heard anything about racism in this conference. As a Latino, I actually know it exists in the United States. And so I would recommend that we kind of figure out how we bring it up. I know it's a touchy subject, but nevertheless, it really stops a lot of opportunity for a lot of people. Thank you. It is a touchy subject. I wasn't. I, I, I wanted to say something that it goes in that realm, and I wanted to mention a resource. On the question that you ask about Arizona and Nevada, I gave uh, some data in the beginning about 46.5% of all children under 18 being children of color. 80% of all those over 65 are white. If you put those together on a chart, you'll see there's a 26% gap. You could call that the racial generation gap in the country. The largest racial generation gap in the country exists in Arizona and Nevada. Uh, Farid Zakaria talked about California. And California, after the war in 1947, looked at itself. And it realized that it was a state in which half of the people were from someplace else. 
that ha one quarter of the population lived in poverty, that only half of the population had a high school diploma, and the majority of the population was white. The state of California under Republican uh, Governor uh, Warren and Democratic Governor Pat Brown uh, decided to treat that population with all of those deficits as an asset. And it created the best public, public school system we've ever seen, the best higher education system, the best health system, the best infrastructure system. And in 1962, Newsweek had a cover, number one state, booming, beautiful California. In many ways, what we're faced with now to create communities of opportunity is to do what California did then. It's not doing it now, but to do what California did then, to be able to invest in the people who will be the future, to create a future that we all want. Thank you so much for coming. Yes. Hi. Where is that? Lee, how you doing? Nice to see you. You're right. Okay.